As long as man has told stories, there has been folklore, tall tales, and in the modern age, urban legends. More recently, the advent of the internet has resulted in an explosion of stories, often referred to as creepypasta. The most well-known creepypastas, such as Slenderman, Jeff the Killer, and the Russian Sleep Experiment, were usually fictional stories originally created by anonymous internet users using a pseudonym. But the lore is oftentimes built upon by the internet community. Usually, the result is that the original author loses control of his or her creation, and that seems to be what happens in 2012 in the case of Smiley. Usually that only happens when the story is good to begin with, but Smiley has proven that there are exceptions. To learn how YouTubers made a horror movie so controversial that it had to be wiped off the face of the internet, and how the legacy of Smiley still persists today, stick around to the end of this video. Welcome to Horror History. I did this one for the lulz. Smiley is the 2012 horror masterpiece directed by Michael Gallagher, who created the OG YouTube channel Totally Sketch. As you can tell by the name, it was a sketch comedy collective in the era of oversaturated and racy thumbnails. In the early days on YouTube, it was a really big deal and would often feature guest appearances from some of the biggest creators on the internet. Michael also has an impressive resume of viral videos he directed for other channels. And his connection to big creators seems to be the entire impetus behind the creation of his first narrative feature. Well, okay, I won't say the entire impetus. Smiley deals with themes surrounding the pitfalls of online stranger danger and the darkest communities on the web. Something that Gallagher is qualified to make a movie about, being an internet creator himself. There are at least 10 YouTubers, or YouTube-adjacent people in this movie that I spotted, which I'll point out as they come up in the story. However, I too am an internet creator, and for that reason, I am qualified to talk about it. But I am not the first. They dropped the ball pretty early on. If you want to see a movie that's boring, I got just the thing for you. It's so stupid. Just made probably the worst plot that I've ever seen in a movie. Don't tell anybody I was in this shit movie. Yeah, it sucked. End of video. Thanks for watching. But does Smiley deserve all the hate? Is there actually something to this movie that others aren't seeing? How can a character who is still being celebrated 11 years later really be that bad? To understand Smiley, we've got to take it back to the group that turned Smiley from a scary story to supernatural stalker. Most good movies are able to thrive on the strength of a captivating script, dynamic characters, stellar acting, and innovative directing. Most masterclasses of cinema do not need to open with a nice ass shot to catch the viewer's attention. But there are exceptions. I am of course talking about Lost in Translation, but Smiley can live up to that too, right? This is Stacy, and she's the first on our YouTuber account because she's played by Nikki Limo from Totally Sketch. Okay, we get it. This is the only way they know how to hold the viewer's attention. Stacy is part of a group of hackers from the online collective Anonymous who have gotten together at Pacific Valley University in Los Angeles to start a new viral trend. Using the internet, they spread rumors of a killer named Smiley, a man who supposedly stitched his eyes shut and carved himself a permanent smile with a knife. You start a video chat with somebody you don't even know, and you type in, I did it for the bulls, three times, and then this guy with the knife appears behind them. And what? So the anonymous group seems to be staging some videos where users on both ends are their members, and these videos naturally get spread around the college and the internet, and the legend grows. Other than Stacy, the Smiley group consists of seven other main players. Kells is played by Richard Ryan, who was also part of Totally Sketch, but is most known for his gun channel, Full Mag, where he blew up smartphones and gaming consoles. This guy, who is only known as Flasher, you'll see why in a minute, is played by Jason Horton, who is part of Totally Sketch, and had a small solo career where he transitioned from sex bait comedy to true crime. Then there's Zane, the party guy, who can often be spotted with two friends. Crash is played by Steve Green from, you guessed it, Totally Sketch. Steve married Nikki Limo in 2017, and they currently do a podcast together. The other friend is named Decepticon and played by Daystorm Power. Daystorm was one of the biggest self-made musicians on early YouTube. Roxy, also known as Proxy, seems to be secretly dating Zane, in the movie that is. And finally, there's Bender, who's seemingly the leader of the group and the mastermind behind the plan. He's played by Shane Dawson, one of the biggest names in comedy then, and the biggest name in conspiracy theory exploration today. Kinda of funny to think that this movie was maybe like his first conspiracy theory thing that he did. By the way, these shirts are available in my merch store, link below. Anyway, these eight make up the Smiley group, and they're willing to do anything to spread fear about Smiley. But making a bunch of fake viral videos will only give the character so much notoriety. Variety. So they decide that they need to actually get someone killed. Roxy has a two-bedroom house near the college campus, so she puts up a listing looking for a roommate and chooses a victim out of the applicants. And they end up selecting Ashley, a new incoming student. Ashley is book smart, but she has no common sense, so she's easy to manipulate. She also has a history of mental illness in her family, and I'm guessing that the Smiley group knew about that and it contributed to them selecting her. Their first goal was to get Ashley to believe in Smiley, but what they didn't realize was that Smiley was not as made up as they thought.
actually moves in with Roxy on September 12th, one day before we see this alarm clock. A later shot makes it look like the year is 2012, though it's kind of blurry because I was only able to get this movie on DVD. It's not available for streaming anywhere. More on that later. Ashley's dad helps her move into the new place, but she only has one box of belongings, apparently. Also, Ashley's dad looks exactly like her dad from Insidious The Last Key, even though it's not the same actor. Text me if you need anything. I think I'll just call. Probably a good idea. <laughs> yes, because texting is too high tech for a man in his 60s in the year 2012. Like maybe you could make that joke in like 2003, 2004, but 2012, he's not texting yet. It kind of feels like there's an intentional theme here. Like they're trying to say technology bad, technology dangerous, but calling is also technology. Roxy invites her new roommate to come to a party and we see that Ashley is not very rebellious, initially hesitant about partying on a school night before awkwardly accepting and shaking her roommate's hand for some reason. Yes. I accept your invitation. Lovely. An interesting detail about their living situation is that Roxy apparently found her online and was stoked to meet someone normal, again playing into the fears of you don't know who strangers really are online. And then this immediately comes up again when Roxy claims that she's never met the people having the party. No, look, I know them, okay? I just haven't met them in person. This guy from B invited LA people to his house for a meetup. I guess I should probably explain what B is in case some people don't know. B is an image board on the forum 4chan where anything goes, as long as it doesn't break the law. 4chan, as you may know, is completely anonymous, which feeds into the theme of online stranger danger. B is the most notorious forum on 4chan, or maybe the entire internet. It has a reputation for grotesque material, and its users are known to band together in the name of trolling including everything from getting 4chan's founder voted in as Time's Person of the Year to convincing teenagers that there was a movement to post self-harm pictures in solidarity with Justin Bieber because he had cancer. Spoiler alert, he didn't have cancer. So they go into the party, and this is the party. I guess I shouldn't have expected much more out of a room of 4chaners, but this looks very awkward. It's hosted by Zane, who meets them and immediately suggests a threesome within the first 20 seconds of knowing them. I mean, I guess he secretly knows Roxy, but, uh... Yeah, not socially adjusted. He also tells them about his area of research at the university. No, but uh, really what I'm interested in is how people start believing in things, you know? Like uh, Bigfoot, for example. You know, there's no evidence that Bigfoot exists, yet lots of people believe in Bigfoot. This is evidence that this movie is just like the 1992 classic, Candyman, except made for an audience in the digital age. In Candyman, the main character, Helen Lyle, was a graduate student doing her thesis on urban legends, and she attended a class at the beginning talking about the same topic, what causes people to believe in these stories. Now why would Danny and Diane both be suffering from the same delusion in two cities over a thousand miles apart? See, these stories are modern oral folklore. They are the unselfconscious reflection of the fears of urban society. Also, Roxy is just inexplicably crying in this one take, which is kind of concerning. Maybe this was the first scene that they filmed and she just had this realization that she's one of the few cast members of this movie who isn't a YouTuber and unlike them, her career is going to be completely ruined by this. Many of the YouTubers in this movie would have their careers ruined, but being in Smiley 2012 wasn't exactly the reason behind it. Speaking of which. Oh, hey. Hey, I think I saw that guy on campus. Yo, they did it. They actually put him in a movie. So in order to, I don't know, better sell the illusion that Smiley is real, Binder and Zane act like they don't know each other. So I guess whoever Ashley sides with can be the one to manipulate her. Hey, hey, what's up? I'm Zane. What's up? I'm Binder. Yeah, what are you doing here, Peta Bear? Don't call me that. Which is very interesting foreshadowing because in 2018, some people took podcast clips where Shane was clearly just joking around and reposted small portions of them out of context to make him look like a pedo. I'm not condoning anything he said, by the way, but it is pretty clear that the clips were edited to make him look worse. You can even see some of that classic Shane style of humor while promoting this movie. Now I have something to do on Halloween which is go see Smiley, because usually I just sit at home and pass out candy, but technically I'm not supposed to be within 50 feet of the children, so I, I more throw out candy. As a result of the scandalous jokes, he had to make this response video. It was a pretty big deal in the world of YouTube drama. I'm gonna start by saying I am not a pedophile. And while he's still doing very well, his views have not been the same since this went down. Anyway, after Shane, I mean Binder, is kicked out of the party, the girls notice some guys on a website called Hide and Go Chat, which is basically an Omegle-esque site that pairs you up with a random stranger on video chat, only this is not a random stranger, it's Stacy. Oh no, is this that site where it just chooses who you talk with? Yeah, Hide and Go Chat. Yeah, you really shouldn't be on this site. 
It's for people that do gross things to other people. Which was very much the case on Omegle, according to its reputation. As I was writing this video, Omegle was actually shut down after 14 years of operation as part of a lawsuit involving child exploitation. Smiley seems to be an allegory for the potential harm that can come out of a site where users are paired anonymously, and this film isn't shy about referencing this. Just like they aren't shy about the totally sketch Easter eggs. People use this to find dates? Yeah, a lot of guys do it. Some of them even do it with their pants off. Okay, see, that's why you shouldn't be on the site. It's way too sketch. Totally. Crash types, I did it for the lulz into the chat three times, and someone in a smiley mask appears behind her and pretends to stab her. I'm pretty sure there's an error in the movie, because at first we see her saying, I did it for the lulz, but it's supposed to be him saying it. And then when we cut to the wide shot, it's fixed, so it's kind of confusing as to who actually said it. And this would have been the easiest pickup shot to fix, because it literally doesn't require any actors or crew, literally just a camera and a computer screen. But they didn't bother fixing it, and it's really the perfect preview of what the quality of this movie is going to be like. But from Ashley's point of view, someone in a cloth smiley mask sneaks up behind the girl on the screen and stabs her at super fast forward speed. Which doesn't make sense considering that we eventually find out that this was staged by a human and Stacy is later revealed to be alive, meaning that what we see here was definitely faked. It seems like for the most part, the Smiley group uses these masks covered in cloth, whereas the real Smiley, who we haven't met yet, just has this smooth skin face with stitches on it. Ashley, being the unfathomably gullible freshman that she is, immediately freaks out and assumes it was real. It's like Bloody Mary, okay? It's an urban legend. You type, I did it for the lols three times across from someone you're chatting with, and then smiley creeps into frame. Because this is another parallel to Candyman, which is also partially inspired by Bloody Mary. In Candyman, you summon him by saying his name in the mirror five times. In Smiley, you type the phrase into the chat three times to summon him. The webcam even kind of serves as a mirror because you see yourself and the person you're chatting with. And like every Candyman movie, the next day things would get real, as Ashley would try summoning the evil for herself. The following day, September 13th, Ashley was late to her first class. One of her classmates is Mark, played by Toby Turner, aka Tobuscus, who used to be one of the biggest channels on YouTube for his skits, gaming, and vlogs. Why do you You're think this class? The girl he's trying to flirt with is played by Michael Gallagher's girlfriend and later wife, Jana Winternitz. Even the teacher has sort of a YouTube connection. He's played by Roger Bart, who is dating professional tantrum haver Trisha Paytas, aka Blind Sundoll for MJ. When Ashley gets home, Roxy informs her that a new Smiley video has surfaced. The video is titled Smiley Kills Drunk Dude, and it fills me with nostalgia to see the good old yellow subscribe button on YouTube. Anyway, we see a cloth mask version of Smiley kill off Kells, who they had met at the party last night. Ashley is scared, but Roxy suggests that they try summoning Smiley in order to find out if he's fake or not. We just do it, nothing happens, and then we know it's fake. Because that way we'll know it's fake for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. For someone who apparently does all her homework assignments from the beginning of the semester, Ashley is really not smart. They scroll through hide and go chat until they get to a flasher. This is Flasher, who I mentioned earlier, and they decide to test the ritual out on him. Apparently every character in the Smiley universe is just so horny that they literally can't think about anything else. Like even after she threatens to kill him, he's just like, make out with each other. So Ashley types the cursed phrase three times, and then this happens. <laughs> This is the most elaborate or lucky part of the plan because it had to work out to where Ashley decided to kill this particular guy, the guy who was a plant. It's possible that since the Smiley group are hackers, they were able to manipulate things on the website so that Ashley and Flasher would definitely meet. Or maybe it's just their website? But that opens a whole other set of issues. How did they know that she was going to kill him? And how did they know she wouldn't test it on her own during the day? There are no answers to these questions. It's just not a very well thought out movie. Roxy convinces Ashley not to go to the police because she claims Smiley has seen their faces and Calling the police would generate press and make it easier for the killer to find them. Basically, it seems like Roxy's making it seem as if she believes that there's nothing supernatural going on here. But if Smiley has the ability to show up behind anyone in the world who receives that message, why would they be treating him as a regular person who has to use logic and reasoning to find his victims? It's pretty clear that the only two options here are that it's staged or that it's supernatural. The next day would be September 14th. In class, Ashley draws Smiley in her notebook and writes, I did it for the lulz three times at the top of her page, which seems like a bad idea because again, she believes this is real. And it's not a huge stretch to assume that if you can summon him by typing the phrase, you could also summon him by writing it. Later in the library, she runs into Binder again. Ah! And he too has more of a realistic approach. I think Smiley's only real when people make him real. Do you think he's real? I don't know if Smiley's real. I mean, I think the videos are real. 
that probably doesn't make any sense. <laughs> no, it really doesn't. Also, they must not have had many extras for this scene because the same people keep walking by over and over. But Ashley gets his number, and since he's playing this whole nerd character, he acts like he's literally never been asked out before. What's your number? Uh, okay. It's awkward. When Ashley gets home, Roxy tells her that Zane is having yet another party. This one at least looks somewhat more like what you would expect a party to look like, but don't worry because the cinematographer makes up for it by not framing it like an actual movie. Here, here, oh, I probably should. Come on, drink it, it's free drink. I don't know what's worse, the fact that Roxy isn't facing the same direction between these two shots, or the fact that she's halfway out of the frame in her coverage. Or maybe it's this guy wearing his wardrobe inside out. The scene is filled with absurd details that are completely inconsequential. I think there was a bug in it. I'm gonna go pee in a closet. <laughs> Okay, so later on there is this sign on the bathroom door that says, Bathroom, no peeing in closet. If we had seen this first, it might have made Roxy's joke land a little bit better, but we don't. In fact, you're unlikely to see it at all unless you're looking for it. So the joke comes off as completely random. If you weren't there in 2012, and by there, I mean on the internet, there was very much this meme movement at the time where random equals funny. I like waffles. <laughs> I'm like the most random person ever. Like, I'm, well, I'm like the king of randomness, like, and it's epic. Potato! <laughs> true, true. I think the perfect encapsulation of this era on the internet is Nyan Cat. It came out in 2011, and there's no story behind why. It's just a cat whose body is a Pop-Tart running through space while emitting a rainbow trail, while this absolute bop of an 8-bit Vocaloid song plays. But where Nyan Cat was loved then and remembered fondly today, I have a feeling Smiley's humor was cringe even when it came out. And seriously, how do you miss the framing this badly? Half her head is out of the frame. Was nobody looking at the monitor? Did the camera operator stitch his eyes shut after seeing the quality of the acting? Ashley had come to the party hoping to get her mind off of Smiley, but that doesn't last long, as she overhears a conversation about yet another victim. <laughs> While Roxy is in the bathroom, Ashley goes over to say hi to Zane, who is hanging out with Crash and Decepticon, hoping to maybe find some answers. Oh, hey, what's up? Hey, I'm um, Ashley. Yeah, yeah, I know. We, uh, we met the other night. You wanted to have sex with me, but I wasn't into it. What? Hmm? <laughs> Yo, oh my god, bro just dropped the funniest joke of all time. Oh, you got her, man, you got her. That one was so funny. This was my least favorite era of pop culture, by the way. Basically, they laugh off her concerns about their missing cohort. It's probably just pulling a freaking prank on us. Hello? They haven't even found the body. Well, do you know where he lives? I don't know. I think with his mom. <laughs> dude, did you just come up with that? Wow, what an epic joke, dude. There, there's no way you came up with that on the spot. It seems kind of counterintuitive for them to mock her, showing actual concern about the video being real, considering that they are trying to get her to believe that it's all real. Like, that's their main objective here, right? Maybe it's like a reverse psychology thing? Like, she'll think it's more real if she's the only one taking it seriously? I feel like that would only work on an idiot. Which she is, but still. Crash even flaunts the truth before her, but she's unable to pick up on it. Maybe it's the end of the Truman Show when your boat just hit the sky mural. <laughs> Zane pulls her aside, and they cut to a shot that's out of focus as he interrogates her on what she saw, where he's again out of focus, then accuses her of summoning Smiley, which he only knows about because he was in on the plan. He tells her that he has summoned the grinning antagonist as well, claiming that Smiley appeared and sliced up a random kid. This makes Ashley sick to her stomach, and she decides to go home. But before she leaves, Zayn continues to demonstrate the worst timing known to man. You can sleep over. Which is a weird play to make on someone who's throwing up to begin with, especially when he just slammed her with that joke when he said he wasn't interested in sleeping with her. There was just so much weird going on in this movie. On my letterbox, I wrote that this movie was a modern day Candyman if Candyman embarrassed itself and everyone involved every five minutes. And that really is true. I'm struggling with what I should include in this video, but like that's too weird not to include. Like for example, she's going home and they use this editing technique to make it look like she's drunk and she confuses some other person for Roxy. Roxy. But that literally looks nothing like Roxy. Ashley was only at that party for three minutes and 58 seconds. Yes, I timed it. If we look back, her roommate spilled her drink immediately and then gave her this other drink, which she took one sip of, then claims that there was a bug in it. So I guess the implication is that she was roofied and it was Roxy and Zane's plan all along to roofie her and have her encounter Smiley on the way home, especially considering this line. What if he comes for the people who call him? 
Have you thought about that? So of course that does happen, even though that wasn't part of the lore at any point before this. But at first, this seems to be the real Smiley, based on the fact that she's approached by this scary figure with the smooth skin face and stitched on features. As far as we know, this is the first time that the legend that the group has created has become real. So she runs home, and inside she's attacked by a fake Smiley, someone wearing the cloth Smiley mask. This is all needlessly confusing, and on top of that, he grabs her and she wakes up in the bed the next morning, still screaming for some reason. I'm gonna try to look past the insanity that has been the last five minutes of this movie and move on. September 15th. Roxy comes in and tries to calm her down again, but Ashley ends up seeing the school psychiatrist where we learn that she used to take medication for bipolar disorder. She now seems convinced that her encounter with Smiley was a dream, so I guess Roxy's dismissive attitude actually worked? So the doctor writes her a prescription for Ativan to relieve anxiety. I just remembered something. I'm not crazy. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Immediately after leaving the psychiatrist's office, she's greeted by Roxy, who delivers news about a new Smiley victim. Number four, if you're keeping count. So they go back to Zane's, again. And he's waving around a gun and reveals he's not a college student, he's a hacker. Which really doesn't explain why he's waving around a gun, but he seems to believe that it does. Who's doing this? We don't know. Okay, well why don't you riddle me this? Who is she? Me? Smiley's trying to kill me! Smiley's trying to kill me! Dude, that shot was not even close to being in focus. You cannot just use that in a movie. Zane is worried, or at least he's acting like he's worried, that whoever's behind this is one of the enemies of his hacking group. You don't get to be king of the internet assholes without making a few enemies. Which seems like a reference to the tagline of the movie The Social Network, which is embarrassing because The Social Network is probably the best movie ever made about the internet, and this may be the worst. He lists off some potential enemies, one of which is the feds. The feds? Could be the FBI. That makes no sense. Why would the FBI go around killing college age kids? If they did something to f with the FBI, I'm pretty sure the FBI would just arrest them. In the night, she has a dream about a woman sitting by her window, which I think is supposed to be her dead mom, but when she approaches, it turns out to be Smiley. But this one seems to actually be a dream, which really just muddies what happened before. I guess maybe that's the intention to just throw off the audience. However, I feel like a good red herring will make sense at the end. Like you can look back at it and say, oh yeah, now I understand why we were led to believe this. Not the case with Smiley. What happened next, however, seems to offer a possible explanation for how Smiley came to be, and I think there's something that everyone overlooked. We pick back up in another class, and it seems to be the following week. It says Thursday on the board, so I guess we're picking back up on September 20th, 2012? Let's go with that. They're now talking about philosophy, which brings up another good question. What is this class? It's called Intro to Reason and Ethics, and it's required. Last week it was about the scientific method, and now philosophy? They're talking about Occam's razor, or the principle that the simplest explanation is usually correct. And Tobuscus gets something right for once. Now, what is the implication of what I just said? It's almost like everything that happened, happened so we could know it happened. What he's describing is the anthropic principle, the idea that the universe seems to be fine-tuned to support the existence of life, even though it's very unlikely. If the laws of the universe were slightly different, there would be no life. And if there was no life, there would be nobody to observe this fact. It's almost as if we, as intelligent life, are supposed to notice that the universe operates in a way that supports life. I will give the movie a little bit of credit here. This is a clever lesson to have Ashley sitting in on, because all of the scenarios that the Smiley group have set up were set up specifically to make her believe in Smiley. It's all a huge prank on Ashley, but she doesn't notice it. She does, however, have an interesting conclusion about the anthropic principle during this lesson. It assumes we're the reason when really we could just be amoebas or whatever simple forms of life were necessary for us to develop we might be what's necessary for something else to develop. And her teacher points out that this may have already started to happen. Humanity may be nothing more than an intermediate step in the development of a consciousness a trillion times greater. We already built it a network, millions of nodes communicating with each other that is called the internet. Let's just hope that when it becomes conscious, it's nice to us. Which I think is actually an interesting concept. Probably not for this movie, but maybe something like M3 Gang. Tobuscus and his girlfriend even bring up a couple of fictional examples, like Terminator and The Matrix. It seems as if this scene is almost here to suggest that Smiley is the incarnation of that higher consciousness. The internet is a series of interconnected users, and we've already seen several examples of how that can be harmful, not to mention that the group of internet trolls that come together to create the fake Smiley are all from the b-board on 4chan, which is infamous for harnessing the power of many to troll and do harm, like I mentioned with the Time Magazine poll and the Justin Bieber cutting thing. 
It could be that the real Smiley is the supernatural incarnation of that concept, the same way that Candyman was the supernatural incarnation of the hurt caused by racial segregation. But Candyman was covered in bees and had a hook for a hand because of the torture that he endured when he was killed. So why does Smiley have a smooth face and permanently stitched smile? Well, sometimes the simplest explanation is the correct one. What if it's just supposed to represent a smiley face emoji? Emoji are kind of a symbol of the internet. And that would kind of explain why you summon him by typing, I did it for the lulz. Like, it's the stupidest thing ever, but it kind of makes sense. Binder even kind of hints at this later on. Do you know what this means? I, mean, I thought I was crazy, but but if this is true, if you're not lying, then that means this, something's been awakened, like something's been born, like Smiley could be the next generation. Are you not listening to me? I really kind of like this whole discussion, how it ties into the false narrative that the 4chaners are creating for Ashley, and how it represents what Smiley actually is. The problem is that it's just too smart for this movie. Because inside the classroom, Ashley is smart and she's the one to put this together, but then outside the classroom, she's a complete smooth brain. So yeah, there's an interesting concept buried in here somewhere, and nobody noticed it because most were too busy laughing at it, and at times, it's hard to blame them. Just remember that Smiley was the original Emoji Movie five years before the Emoji Movie. Also, when I googled the Emoji Movie to double check what year it came out, the first thing that caught my eye was this cast list icon, Patrick Stewart, poop. Which is pretty funny if you think immature humor is funny, which I absolutely do. Anyway, let's move on. Ashley goes to the library and finally googles Smiley Urban Legend and finds a video from a little girl whose babysitter was supposedly killed by Smiley. We see what appears to be Smiley come up and poke her with a knife, but it turns out to just be Bender, but he doesn't have a knife. I get that this is our foreshadowing clue that he's Smiley and that he was behind it all, but I'm not sure what I, as an audience member, am supposed to take away from that in a literal sense. When she admits that she performed the ritual and saw someone die, his reaction sounds like one of those old edgy podcast clips that got him canceled a few years ago. I killed someone. Are you serious? Oh, it's amazing. I mean, that's terrible, obviously, but... I tried to do it, nothing happens. She goes home and clicks through a bunch of strangers on hide and go chat, for some reason. As usual, it's just filled with horny people until she comes across someone sitting in the dark who asks if he should visit her again and claims to be standing behind her. When she turns around, she sees Roxy, who berates her for going back on the website. This is another kind of foreshadowing clue because Roxy is also secretly part of the Smiley group. She tries calling her dad for comfort, but Smiley's voice seems to take over her phone. So she returns to the psychiatrist, admits what she really thinks she saw, and they plan to meet the following day to check her into a clinic. An office visit with her teacher isn't much help either. Turns out he's an alcoholic. I'm not really sure what that adds to the story, but they make a point to highlight it. Maybe this is too much of a nitpick, but as the teacher explains his views on evil, they're locked face to face in conversation, and we see these profile shots of each of them. But it's just super off-putting to me how their heads are centered in the frame rather than their faces. Usually as a director, when you compose a frame, the negative space is in the direction that the character is looking. Like this profile shot in Candyman. By framing their heads like this, the result is this shot where the focal point is Ashley's ear instead of her face. Anyway, she gets freaked out when he says this. What is it that the kids say? It's the perfect expression of nihilism. I did it for the... Lulz? Yeah, that's it. I did it for the lulz. How are we supposed to take this seriously? Later, she's in the library working on a paper when she hears weird growling in her headphones, and Smiley, that is the fake mask version of Smiley, suddenly appears on her screen. And she responds by destroying her entire computer rather than just turning it off or doing a factory reset, making our usual pair of extras who are in every library scene think that she's insane, and some random skater boy records her breakdown and puts it online. This is actually a director's cameo from Michael Gallagher. Then, in what I'm assuming is another night because she's wearing completely different clothes, but I wouldn't put it past this movie to not have the wardrobe department together either, Ashley is jump scared when someone in the smiley mask appears behind her in the mirror, but he immediately disappears. Since this person is wearing the cloth smiley mask, but clearly demonstrates the ability to disappear, I'm guessing this was just her imagination. But again, with this movie, there's always the option that it was a mistake and they just used the wrong mask or something. I'm gonna assume it was Ashley starting to lose her mind, because after this, she would be driven to a mental breaking point. That night, dark dreams cloud Ashley's head once again, this time involving multiple smiley mask killers in her room and imagery of her mother turning into smiley to drool blood on her. Upon awakening, she poses the question that we've all been wondering for the last while now. Is this real or am I just going crazy? I think both, dude. So she finally decides to call the police, and they predictably don't take her seriously at all. I'm gonna tell you the part I'm having a hard time with. All of it. 
<laughs> Based. He does mention that they've received a few calls about Smiley and asks her to consider if she's on the wrong end of some kind of prank, which she angrily refuses to entertain. They have also seen the video of her smashing her laptop, which has been uploaded as Hot Girl Goes Crazy in Library. Now remember, the one who recorded this video was the Michael Gallagher insert. So is he making fun of his own channel where all of his most popular videos have one thing in common? And if you're listening to this audio only, you can look at the screen right now to see what that one thing is? Or does Michael actually see this as unironically how to do YouTube? The timing of this is also super interesting because Smiley came out in 2012. That was the year YouTube changed its algorithm to focus on watch time in order to help combat clickbait and promote good content that keeps viewers engaged. There's also another mistake right here. These are the old YouTube editing features. They should have been logged out to record this because we're seeing this on the police detective's computer. They would not be logged into Michael's YouTube account. This is another error that would be easy to fix in editing like this, but they didn't bother. As a last resort, Ashley meets with Bender, who gives her an old computer of his that he set up with all of the data encrypted. And even though he's still playing the part of the self-pitying loser, she makes a move on him and they kiss. Roxy also claims that she's going away to her parents' house for the weekend to clear her head, so the stage is set for the final step of their plan. Once night has fallen, Roxy video chats her in a panic, thinking that something may have happened to Zane, who isn't answering her calls. Ashley volunteers to go over to his place to check on it. How convenient that there was just a flashlight laying on the floor right in front of the unlocked door. Not that you actually tried turning on the light, I mean, the patio lights seem to work just fine, so there's no reason to believe that the power is out. Not to mention that there's music playing in the distance. Seriously, why don't you just try the light switch once? She finds the words, I did it for the lulz, graffitied across the wall, and she discovers Zane, apparently covered in blood on the floor. Don't worry, he's not dead, and it's not real blood, so I can show it. Also, why would you scream when you see the body? The killer could easily be standing nearby, and you'd just be calling attention to yourself. She finds all of the monitors in his living room kind of area glitching out with a video of the smiley mask behind it all, so she starts to destroying them. Because that worked so well last time, right? She also grabs Zane's gun, which has seemingly been left out for her, much like the flashlight. It seems a little dangerous to give the person with a history of psychiatric issues a gun, especially when you're actively trying to make her go crazy through an elaborate prank that you're pulling. I'm gonna give Zane the benefit of the doubt and assume that the gun is filled with blanks and not real bullets, but it still seems like more trouble than it's worth. She returns home to the video chat with Roxy and asks her to type, I did it for the lols. The idea is that they'll summon Smiley behind her and then Ashley can turn around and shoot him with the gun. If Smiley is real, this is a terrible plan because we literally just established that Zane had the gun and he was still unable to overcome Smiley. So they go through with it, and Ashley sees someone coming in through the front door and fires as soon as he opens it. Only, she finds out that this wasn't Smiley. It was her knight in shining armor, Bender. Never mind the idea that he immediately just tries to enter the house without knocking or calling, even though they've only known each other for, at this point, like three weeks and aren't that close yet. How they accomplished their plan is never explicitly detailed, but like I said, I'm guessing the gun was filled with blanks and Bender was wearing a squib so he could make it look like she had shot it. Honestly, I'm going to get into how this plan is terrible and would only work if absolutely everything goes right, but let's see the plot through to the end first. Ashley tries to tend to Bender, but that's when someone in a smiley mask appears from behind him and slits his throat. Or so it seems. She probably could have seen him approaching, but whatever. She's chased through the house up to her room where she locks herself in and waits with the gun drawn, only to realize that someone in a smiley mask is in the room with her already, and she's all out of bullets. She's cornered by several more smiley mask killers, and in an act of desperation, she jumps through an absolutely terrible looking CGI window and falls to her death. Or at least what appears to be her death. It's not that high, but she hit her head on the ground. Boys. We f***ing did it. This is kind of what establishes that they wanted to kill her the whole time. I don't know why they wanted to kill her, and I don't know why they didn't just throw her out the window in order to accomplish that. I get that they are 4chan posters and they like chaos or whatever, but it seems like if they wanted to spread the legend of Smiley, Ashley could do that for them if she had survived. Also, it's not clear what this has to do with Anonymous. They're actually worried that the main faction of the hacking group won't approve of their message, but Binder argues that because Anonymous is Anonymous, that they should get as much say in the message as anyone else. It seems like overall they just see themselves as trolls who killed someone. Because, I mean, there's only one reason to troll. For the lulz. For the lulz! You have got to be kidding me. Binder and Zane go on to explain that Smiley will become immortal because they left boxes of masks on campus and in 20 other campuses. Their belief is that copycats will start rolling in and the legend will persist for generations. We'll get back to that. But first, there is one thing that hasn't been taken into account. The Smiley group all leave the house except for Zane, who stays back to wrap up the video chat with Roxy, who is still on the computer. And the camera goes out of focus on him one last time because it wouldn't be right to end this movie without one last f up. 
I kind of have a boner. Is that weird? Yes, that's weird. I mean, I would pose the question, why is this movie so unnecessarily horny? But I think one look at the Totally Sketch channel already answered that. Roxy seems to be the only one who has reservations about what they did to Ashley. She asks why they did this, and Zane already has his answer figured out. Oh, well, I don't know why you did it, but I know why I did it. He proceeds to type, I did it for the lols, three times into the chat, and is aghast at the sight of Smiley, the real Smiley, appearing behind her and driving his knife through her face. The last thing he sees is Smiley waving at him before closing the laptop. While the ending of Smiley fits right into the slasher genre as a textbook one last scare moment, it really makes everything that we just witnessed for the last hour and a half, which is already standing on shaky legs, make even less sense. If this were the first time we had seen a real Smiley, I could understand that. It would be him being born as a real entity for the first time at the end of the movie. But that isn't what happened, because we saw the real Smiley approach Ashley as she was stumbling back from Zane's second party on September 14th. And presumably, a couple weeks after that, we saw Roxy type the phrase and try to summon Smiley, and nothing happened. So why didn't he show up then? Is he just lazy? Does he only show up when he feels like it? And the more I think about it, the more the ending starts to fall apart. Several members of the Smiley group faked their deaths and went missing for several days to sell the illusion to Ashley. So what's gonna happen to them? Do they have to change their names and move to another town? Isn't the FBI eventually gonna come looking for them and find them? It would certainly be strange if they all just suddenly reappeared after Ashley's death. I was also somewhat misled by some of the movie's marketing. In the movie, we see the fake smiley mask used by the group with the black fabric cover on top and the smooth skin face, which I refer to as real smiley. But in the trailer, we see a smooth smiley mask on the ground next to one of the nylon covers. And then in this ad, there's just a smooth white mask being worn by Ashley that we never see in the movie. But it doesn't end there because the main poster shows a headshot of smiley with this burlap sack texture. So to make things easy, and because I wouldn't consider marketing to be canon in most cases anyway, let's just throw out everything that isn't in the movie. You know what? Let's throw out these terrible press stills too, just because they're cringe. But there is one line that I want to go back to. Oh God, something tells me Smiley's going to be really popular this Halloween. Oh, it's going to be historic. People are going to be speaking our names for generations. He talks about Smiley leaving a legacy, being remembered for future generations. My first thought was that this was hilariously off the mark, because only 11 years later, you have to jump through hoops to even watch the movie. But as I poured more and more time into this video about a character who I thought would be forgotten by most and maligned by those who do remember, except Balls.com on Letterboxd who said, I loved hearing this from my room while on the shitter, I started to discover something that surprised me. Smiley is being remembered pretty fondly. No, not the movie, it's nearly impossible to find a positive review of that, but rather the character. There is something creepy about the featureless face with only that huge, unchanging smile stitched into it, like a man in agony trapped in a prison of delightful expression. The movie released in October 2012 to universally negative acclaim and even managed to piss off the real Anonymous, allegedly, some of whom harassed and threatened director Michael Gallagher, but in the years that followed, it would be the icon of Smiley that persisted in pop culture. It started in November 2013 with YouTube makeup artist Pink Stylist uploading a Smiley makeup tutorial based on overwhelming viewer requests. Pink admits that he's never seen the movie, but thought the character looked awesome based on the advertisement, which definitely tracks, and the video sits at 8.1 million views as of recording. The following year, he took the look on Omegle to mess with people, where he ironically ran into a kid wearing an anonymous mask. A lot of people recognized him as Smiley as well, including one kid who tried to find out what happens when you write I did it for the lulz while in a video chat with Smiley. What's up behind you? The video has racked up an astonishing 28 million views, and as the characters in the movie predicted, the legend only seemed to spread from there. Binder specifically mentioned Smiley Halloween costumes, and this became kind of a phenomenon. According to Michael Gallagher, he was receiving hundreds of photos of Smiley costumes four years later in 2016, and people from all over the world went as Smiley in 2017. The popularity of the look persisted into the next decade, when special effects artist Greg McDougal showed off and explained the mask used in the movie. Perhaps the biggest fan of Smiley was Minneapolis-based indie filmmaker Ryan Zimmerman. No, not that Ryan Zimmerman, who began work on a fan film prequel called Smiley Origins in 2019. The original Smiley movie seems to already show the origins of the character though, so I'm not sure what this movie was going to entail, because it hasn't come out. There was a trailer released in 2020, but unfortunately, as of April 2023, the project seems to be on an indefinite hiatus. Even in this year, as of recording this video in 2023, Pink Stylist came back with a Valentine's Day variant, just for the lulz. I guess it makes sense that in a movie made by YouTubers and 
featuring YouTubers, the legacy of this movie is essentially just this viral character. Speaking of which, the last couple YouTuber cameos to point out are seen in the random chat partners on the Hide and Go Chat website. A couple notable ones are Exotic Jess, who collaborated with a lot of big channels back in the day. Another is Brie Esrig, who similarly found herself in a lot of collabs, including a stint with Totally Sketch, and she went on to be a host on SourceFed. One thing that YouTube is great for that traditional films aren't is getting the audience involved. So that's exactly what Michael Gallagher did for the other faces that appeared on the chat site. Leave a video response of yourself looking at your webcam, bored, happy, making faces, whatever you want to do, and I might choose you to be in the movie. Which is pretty cool and might be the widest casting call ever created. So let's bring it back to the question that I posed at the beginning of this video. Does Smiley deserve all of the hate? I mean, yeah, kinda. Well, maybe not all of it. It didn't live up to the hype, it has low ratings everywhere, and you can't even get it on streaming services anymore, which I found baffling because having it available for streaming costs them very little, and even if nobody buys it, nothing is really lost. I'm guessing it has something to do with Shane Dawson getting in controversy and Toby Turner getting in controversy, and the company just deciding that it wasn't worth potentially being connected to them for a movie that wasn't bringing in any meaningful revenue anyway. So they just decided to try to erase it from the public eye. But if they knew anything about the internet, it's that nothing goes away on the internet, and Smiley continues to live on a decade later. Even if the movie isn't the best, there are a couple of redeeming qualities, so hopefully this video helped you find some appreciation for them. Michael Gallagher is far from a lost cause as a director. After this, he went on to make another movie with Shane Dawson called Internet Famous, then returned to the horror genre to make two installments of The Thinning starring Logan Paul. Yeah, Michael Gallagher really knows how to pick up. Yeah. Maybe if this video does well, I'll cover The Thinning in the future. I haven't seen Internet Famous or The Thinning, but let's just make one thing clear. Smiley isn't bad because it's filled with YouTubers. It's bad because it's just bad. It's low effort and it's low budget. You gotta pick one or the other. And it seems that there was a lot of inexperience in all areas of the crew. My first videos were definitely terrible, and this is a new medium for almost everyone involved. But let's not overlook that some of the best movies in recent years have been made by YouTubers or star YouTubers. Lights Out was one of the most memorable horror movies of a strong decade. Eighth Grade was amazing. Aquafina is killing it. I could go on and on. It takes a lot of dedication to build an audience in a world where audiences can choose whatever they want, and I think those who decide to cross over to old school Hollywood are gonna continue to put out some amazing stuff. If you made it this far in the video, do me a favor and write I did it for the lols three times in the comments. Don't forget to check out the merch store for my Shane Dawson inspired horror merch, and if you love horror, or if you just love YouTube, make sure you subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week, ring the death bell for all notifications, and I will see you in the next one. Assuming we both survive.